Prince will be providing us an exhortation. His exhortation is titled Responsibility. And he has asked that we read from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That will turn our attention to Brother Caleb and his exhortation, Responsibility. Good morning. So I had kind of a difficult time picking a topic uh, today. Um, thought about a bunch of different things and nothing really seemed to, to grab me. Um, and whenever I, it's happened before, whenever I feel that, that um, not being able to pick a topic, it kind of shows me where I am in my spiritual life. If I'm not very passionate about something, then I should probably push myself to become passionate about something. Uh, luckily though, I have a great wife, Corinne, helped me come up with this topic of responsibility. Like all my topics that I try to speak on, um, first and foremost, this is for myself and not directed at anybody. Uh, it's more of an inward look. So what does it mean to be responsible in the Lord? This morning, I'd like to focus on a few of the ways that we can show our responsibility with those of being accountable to God, our service to others, and finally, our hope in the Lord. So the most simple, def most simple definition of being accountable is taking ownership of our actions. Throughout the Bible, we know of several examples of both faithful and non-faithful who took responsibility. Right away, we think of Moses, Gideon, King David, Jonah, Peter, and so on. All of these men were, were considered to be extremely faithful, but at times failed to be responsible servants of God. The key to all these examples, though, is the key to ultimately being faithful stewards to God, and that's repentance and total change of their present circumstance. And for most of these men that I just listed above, uh, there's normally one pivotal sin or one moment that God chose to focus on as an example for us of how they overcame that, that sin. And we know with Moses, Moses was commanded to strike the rock once, but he smote it twice. This action led him to never being able to see the promised land, even though he had just spent the last years wandering, the, wandering with the children of Israel. Gideon doubted God's ability to provide them with the victory over their enemies. We know of King David's sin, he committed both murder and adultery, and this led to the death of his child, and he also never had peace throughout his reign. Jonah decided to pass his judgment on the people of Nineveh, rather than to follow the instruction of the Lord. And finally, although Peter was considered to be a rock, he faltered and denied Jesus when he was given the opportunity and given the chance to stand for Jesus. But the reason why these men are listed as faithful in the Bible is because of the way they responded to their indiscretion. For most of the men listed above, there's really not another recorded sin. Obviously, they did commit other sins, 
But again, God chose to focus on this important sin to show us as an example that we can overcome these things with the right heart. And the importance is, is that the way we respond to our sin is often more important than the sin itself. Whether it be stubbornness, doubt, fear, or lack of faith, these are all things that these men struggled with as well as us. But again, what separates these men is how they altered their lives and the course and their response. So the question for us, what is our immediate response when we are caught doing something wrong? Um, the older we get, and especially I think for myself, the older I get, it's harder to self-examine our response to wrongdoing. So whenever you're growing up, you know, all of us had parents who disciplined us regularly. They got onto us, they let us know when we did something wrong, but more importantly, they showed us the right way to own up to our mistake. But as adults, uh, we're kind of left to self-govern that. So if we're called out for something or we know we do something wrong, no one is behind us telling us this is how we should respond. So it really puts an emphasis on our honesty with our Heavenly Father. Like other people we come in contact with, God knows our thoughts and actions, and no half-hearted response to sin is acceptable to God. We know that God rewarded and will reward all of these men because of their accountability when it mattered most, because they embodied what it meant to be responsible servants to the Lord. After David was revealed to be the rich man with many flocks and herds, David immediately responded in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. So to be accountable unto God, we have to recognize our error. We have to come before God, acknowledging our shortcomings and having the faith that with true repentance, God will forgive. Paul tells us an important aspect of forgiveness though. Should I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Just like a parent with a child, there is a limit to God's mercy. And I think it's very foolish for us, and I consider myself to do the same thing, to think that if we continually do the same things over and over, and we continue to do the same sins, that God will keep forgiving us of these sins. Since the beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden, we know that there has been a consequence due to our actions. This started with Adam whenever he was given a specific task and was told to command it, and he was expected to obey it. So at times when we try to avoid responsibility, that's usually through blame shifting or not owning up to your mistake. We know Adam did this whenever he blamed Eve for his sin in Genesis 3, verse 12. Not long after, Cain tried to dodge his responsibility in Genesis 4, verse 9. In going to the New Testament, Pilate attempted to absolve his guilt and sentencing Jesus to death and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is now your responsibility. That's in Matthew 27, verse 24. Number says, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. So it's important that we understand that God knows our thoughts and actions. So honesty and accountability to God is what we need to strive for. Another aspect of being a responsible steward to God is out of our service to our brothers and sisters and all those who we come in contact with. So what is our responsibility? How do we serve one another and how do we actively serve one another? Consider some of our own individual struggles. How could someone have intervened in your life to prevent you from sinning? And what impact can we have on someone else's life to prevent them from sinning? An important thing to remember is that in the end when we're judged by God, we are not going to be judged on what this person did or what that other person did. We're going to be judged according to our own individual actions or lack of action when we know that we're called on to assist those who need help. With that being said, we know that we are responsible to every person we meet, both within the household and outside, because we have one true faith that we need to share and we need to do so with love. One key to serving your spiritual family 
is to recognize signs of spiritual struggle within someone. Maybe we should take a more active approach within each other's spiritual lives. And when we do intervene or we do help out, do we follow up with that person to ensure that their spiritual and emotional needs are met? Too often is someone rebuked and then left alone to deal with the consequences of what they did. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 7. Philippians 2, 1 to 7. If there be therefore any consultation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let us each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So again, what is our follow-up whenever someone is approached about wrongdoing, and once it's brought to their attention, do we come back to them afterwards and make sure that they are able to overcome what happened. And I know, speaking for myself, um, sometimes I can get really uh, uncomfortable whenever I'm asked how my spiritual life is going. Um, and, and we've all heard the phrase, you know, we missed you at meeting last week or we missed you at that class. And not once have I ever actually thought that someone was trying to make me feel guilty about it. But um, if I'm being honest, my first response is to get defensive in my head to say, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal. It's one class. It's, it's one meeting. Um, and just as a personal example, uh, growing up, we were super involved in sports um, and we would go up and down the East Coast for soccer tournaments. Um, and we were never allowed to, to miss meeting for it. And the only way we were able to go to these tournaments is if there was a meeting within driving distance. And even if it was a, a win or go home game, uh, we were never allowed to play. And that was something, I'm very competitive. I'm not so much competitive anymore, but uh, Corinne says, yeah, I am. But uh, that was something that was always really hard to understand. That really frustrated me. And in my mind, I thought, who cares if I miss one Sunday school or who cares if I miss memorial service? I'm not baptized, so, you know, what, what's, what's the harm? But the older I got, the more I realized how important it was. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So whether we're going through a spiritually rough time or not, chances are there is someone in our ecclesia that is, or someone that we know that is. The more people missing, the more times we aren't around to support that person, the more this seems tolerable to those who might be struggling or doubting. In order to be responsible servants of the Lord, we must be there for each other and be accountable for each other. And this is the importance of fellowship. We're here this morning to First and foremost, to remember Christ's sacrifice, but fellowship is equally as important. We're here to uplift each other. We're here to bring support to each other. So again, are we active in service? Are we taking responsibility? And are we taking accountability not only for our actions, but the actions of our brothers and sisters? The greatest example of service, obviously, was, was Jesus. Paul said of him that he took the very nature of a servant. And Jesus said of himself that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus knew on the night of his betrayal that the next morning he was going to suffer on the cross. And from my viewpoint, he would have had every right to be selfish, every right to not do anything for anyone else and to sit there in reflection and prayer to God. 
But we know that that's not what Jesus did. Jesus took the time to wash the feet of his guests. And back then, uh, the person's job that was, was normally the lowest of the low of the servants. I mean, these were, these were people who, you know, they did the worst jobs. And Jesus, even though he knew he was going to die, chose to do that. And he did this under full awareness of who he was and what his task was. John says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. So it was not in spite of Jesus' greatness, but because of his greatness that Jesus served his disciples on that evening. And through actions, through Christ's action of service, he taught us what the true greatness of the kingdom of God is going to be about. It's not going to be about position. It's not going to be about authority. But it's going to be about serving one another and in doing so, bringing glory to God. The last component of being responsible in our service to God is hope. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So how do we move forward spiritually if we are unsure of what to look forward to? Like the examples of the faithful we mentioned earlier, all of them recognized what they were waiting for. Moses, although he was not able to enter into the promised land, knew an entrance would be granted to him to the everlasting promised land. We know through David's actions, King David never saw peace in his lifetime. He was never able to build the house of the Lord, but he recognized that through his spiritual service and through his leadership, Solomon would soon follow and Solomon would build the house of the Lord. Peter was known for his boldness. And Peter was the first and the only one to jump out of the ship and walk to Jesus. Peter was the first to react when they came to take Jesus away. Although the actions portrayed by these men at times showed a lack of faith or hope, their resilience to press on and change their ways shows us how we should follow God. I think kind of like belief, hope has now become more of a ambiguous term for our day. We hear phrases like, we hope we don't get sick. We hope we get the job. We hope we can pay our bills. We hope we can maintain friendships. We hope for things we'd like to have or events we'd like to see happen. We use hope to describe how we feel about things or what we desire. And nowadays, hope has basically become a term synonymous with wishful thinking. When we think about hope in this way, as a vague sense of maybe someday things will get better, or eventually I might get this thing that I really want, is it any wonder that we can be considered a lost and a hopeless generation? True hope is never wishful thinking, nor a mere desire for something we'd like to see happen. Instead, the Bible consistently represents and presents hope as a confident expectation, an assurance of what is to happen in the future, and even an anticipation of that future. Hope is the essence of our life in the Lord, and is one of the deepest virtues as followers of God that we can have. We are to find joy in hope, we're to overflow with hope, to boast in hope, hold firmly to our hope, and even give defense to our hope. We are to endure trials because trials produce character, which in turn produces hope. According to scripture, we should be nothing less than hopeful. We are hopeful not only because of some vague sense that things may get better, but because we are certain of what is to come and confident in the one who has promised to bring it about. We are hopeful people because of the object of our hope. And we know that all of these examples work together as one. Without being accountable for our own actions, we cannot serve one another. Without service to one another, we have no hope and cannot glorify God. The kingdom will be made up of those faithful throughout the years 
that put God and everyone else before themselves. So knowing we are in battle against sin, we should want as much help as we can gather around us, and this may include making ourselves accountable to each other. Paul tells us that we must be equipped with all the power that God supplies to fight this battle. I'd like to close by looking at Ephesians 6, verse 13. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul emphasizes here this word, to stand. By standing, we're, we're prepared. We're ready to move forward. And more importantly, if we're standing, we can take advantage of the full armor of God that he has given us. And we know through these verses that without a doubt, temptation will come and temptation does come. So we must be prepared. Thank you.